Tonight we continue our series of Lenten sermons based on the theme, Ironies of the Passion. And tonight we hear another our irony as Jesus tells us, do this in remembrance of me. We find this, our text, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning at the 23rd verse. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is God's word. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Forgive, O oh Lord, the dullness that too frequently overcomes us as you draw us to your table. Remind us of the blessings of forgiveness and salvation you provide for us there. Send faithful pastors who will admonish our wrongs, remind us of your love in Christ, and encourage us to receive the forgiveness brought to us in your sacrament. Unite us in love and fellowship with those whom you have redeemed who join us at your table. Amen. You may be seated. Your brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. I've had this for about 36 years. And it is something that's very, very, very precious to me. 36 years ago when I was getting ready to go off for college to study to be a pastor... I went to visit my grandmother just to say goodbye before going to school. And as I was visiting with Grandma, she said, come over here and sit by me. And that wasn't something that she had said to me for quite a while, you know, I, since I had been a little boy. When I came over and sat next to her, she had tears coming down her eyes, and she reached next to her table by the stand that was next to it underneath, and she pulled this out and she gave it to me. And I knew exactly what it was. It was her it's her confirmation Bible in German. And it was, she says, I want you to have this. She knew that I'd be studying German a little bit in, in college, and she wanted me to have this. And this is something that's very precious to me for a bunch of different reasons. It's precious because when I was a very little boy, grandma would sit with me in her lap, and she would read to me out of this Bible in German, and then explain to me what it meant. While she would be explaining what it meant, she'd often sing to me some of her favorite hymns. Then, it's also the book that she kept family records of, in births, and weddings, and, and, uh, and funerals, and the like, kind of the whole, the whole family record. And she gave this to me. And it's something that to me that's very important for those reasons. And it's a nice memorial of my grandmother. Because it, it wasn't only, it was just a few months later when my grandmother passed away. So this sits up on my shelf in my office. Every once in a while I take it out and look at it. Sometimes in my Bible study. A lot of times just kind of trying to remember different events that happen in the family. But this is a really wonderful, my most precious remembrance of my grandmother. Remembrance. We heard about that tonight in our text, didn't we? When Jesus instituted his Lord's, the Lord's Supper, the sacrament of Holy Communion, he told his disciples to do this often. To do this often in remembrance of him. A remembrance. What's so important about a remembrance? 
There's some sentimental value. There's good in remembering things. And it's an encouragement that our Lord gives to us. In Holy Communion, you and I see a real presence remembrance. That first Monday, Thursday, the last time that Jesus celebrated the Passover with his disciples was one that was really different than the ones that those disciples and even Jesus celebrated for their whole lives. They could tell a difference in the demeanor of Jesus. Instead of being maybe happy-go-lucky, acting normal, they could see a difference. They could see that he was quiet. We're told that the disciples could see that he was mournful and concerned. And after all, Jesus knew what was going to happen to him. He had been trying to prepare his disciples for this, that he was going to be arrested, that he was going to be convicted, and he was going to be crucified. He was going to die in just a matter of hours. And Jesus had care and concern for his disciples. He wanted them to be able to get through this. He wanted them to be able to be strong through this. He didn't want them to be able, he didn't want them to despair. And while Jesus was, all of this was weighed with all of this, he also took the opportunity, did something different in his celebration of the Passover with his disciples that he had never done before. During that meal, he took the unleavened bread that was there on the table, part of that meal, broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take this and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Did the same thing with the cup. Gave it to them, take a drink. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Jesus wanted his disciples to remember what he had done, for, was going to do for them, and what he had done for them. Now, if Jesus wanted to leave his disciples something that was going to cause them to remember deeply what he had done, especially from this Passover meal, there are some things, at least I could think of some things, would have been better for Jesus would have been, maybe in my way of thinking, better for Jesus to use if he wanted them to remember that. And that would have been the, pa the Passover lamb. He could have said these things while he was they were eating that lamb, eating that meat, because that Passover lamb, after all, was something that Jesus was the fulfillment of. In fact, it was John the Baptist when he saw Jesus pointed to him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And after all, Jesus was the fulfillment of that Passover lamb that was sacrificed that night and eaten and had been sacrificed for all the Passovers before that. But Jesus chose to use bread and wine. Why would he take bread and wine and tell his disciples to eat and to drink and remember? It was because he wanted them to remember concretely what he had done for them. Notice what he says. He said, this is my body. This is my blood. This is how Christians for almost 2,000 years have understood the words of Jesus. There are some today that don't really like to that to understand those words in the way that Jesus intended them or the way that most of Jesus' followers have understood them for millennia. They say Jesus couldn't possibly have meant this is my body, this is my blood. They say, well, you know what? Jesus was wanted us to remember, but he really meant take and eat, this represents my body. This represents my blood. You know what, Jesus could have said that if he wanted to, but he didn't choose those words, that word to represent. He said, this is. Some people say, well, that didn't matter. Jesus was using a metaphor. You know, after all, didn't Jesus say, I am the gate? I am the door to heaven? Are you mean, really mean to tell me that Jesus was saying, I'm, I'm, I'm a door? 
Did he really mean I represent the door? No, he didn't. Because if Jesus represents the door, that means there's other doors. And he is the only door to heaven. Is still means is. Jesus isn't using a metaphor here. He was telling his disciples and telling you and me that when we eat the bread and drink the wine and the sacrament, that we are receiving Jesus' body and blood with that bread and wine. Yet human reason likes to come in and try to over-explain things. There are some Christians that say, oh yes, we receive Jesus' body and blood, but the pastor changes it into bread and wine. And then they say, or changes it into body and blood. And then it becomes a re-sacrifice of Jesus' body and blood. No. The Bible tells us in the letter to, the, to Hebrews in the New Testament that Jesus was sacrificed once for all. That because his sacrifice, because of the shedding of his blood, it was perfect. It was exactly what was needed to, to satisfy God's demand of perfection and and death with his blood, no more sacrifice needed to be made. And is means is, not changed into. Communion is something that God does for us, not us for him. This is a real presence remembrance. But you know, there's something else with this too. In Holy Communion, as Jesus tells us to do this in remembrance of him, Holy Communion is a gospel remembrance. It is in this means of grace where we really see pure gospel. We see Jesus' love, we see his care, we see his concern. We see and experience what he is doing for us. Law is what a person does. And scripture tells us we cannot be saved by the law. Scripture tells us we cannot receive forgiveness of sins through the law. It only comes through the gospel. Jesus says, take and eat. This is my body. Take and drink. This is my blood. Poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus could not be any plainer. He couldn't explain it any more clear. That through this eating and drinking we receive the very body and blood that he gave on the cross for us. And through that, we receive the forgiveness of sins. And scripture tells us wherever we receive the forgiveness of sins, there's also strengthening of faith. There's life now and in eternity and salvation. What a blessing that God gives to us. This is a gospel remembrance. And especially, too, there's some words, there's two short little words here that can be easily overlooked. Jesus says, given and poured out for you. Okay? Notice that when Jesus says that, he doesn't say given and poured out for mankind given and poured out for the world. And that is something that's definitely true. But he says, given and poured out for you. What in effect Jesus is saying, in fact, that you is not even a plural, it's a singular. It really hits home. So when those words are being spoken, this is what Jesus says. Given and poured out for Tom, given and poured out for Lydia, given and poured out for Jean, given and poured out for Levon, given and poured out for you. You can put your name right there. That makes this something that is very, very personal. This is a gospel remembrance, a beautiful remembrance. And this is something that goes more deep, it goes deeper than just having some type of sentimental attachment to a gift that maybe somebody has given us. Whether it's been, you know, some, whether it's a, 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 a photograph, whether it's a painting, whether it's even one of the most expensive gifts you can have, a keepsake, an heirloom. This goes past sentimentality. 
This goes back past emotion. This gets right down to the heart of the matter. Right down to our Savior. Ooh, the Apostle John tells us before Jesus even walked into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, we're told that Jesus said the words, Greater love has no one than this, that he give up his life for his friends. That's what Jesus did for you and for me. Jesus knew everything that was ahead of him, but what drove him to go to suffer, to die, to experience the punishment of hell that you and I and all mankind deserves is his love. His love which goes deeper than a sentimentality, deeper than, 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 than a feeling. It's a commitment. It's the perfect love which only Jesus can give. The perfect love which only Jesus can work. The perfect love which only Jesus can assure us with, and the only place that you can, find, you and I can find assurance and confidence and certainty. What a blessing that is! Something for us to cherish and to hold on to, and to remember every time we come here to the Lord's table. You know, the Apostle Paul also talks about those blessings. The end of our text talked about some things that are kind of sobering words, aren't they? Listen again to where he says, For anyone who eats and drinks this cup, drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That's why many of you among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. Some of us are old enough to remember when we were in confirmation class, maybe hearing our pastors read this from the King James Version, saying, you can eat and drink damnation upon yourself. That's scary. We kind of talked about that in our church council meetings when we talked about having, before we went back to offering communion twice a month. I remember there was some fear, there was some fear in, in not taking the Lord's Supper seriously and, 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 and thoughtlessly and thinking that maybe that was too many times. But Jesus tells us to do this often. Now, does that mean that we shouldn't worry about being prepared? No, we need to be prepared. Being prepared is knowing and believing that Jesus says he gives us his body and blood and forgiveness in the sacrament. It's realizing that we're sinners and that we're, we need to repent of our sins and leave them at the feet of Jesus. Realizing that I'm a sinner who deserves nothing but hell. That's being prepared. And there have been times where, yes, you and I have gone to the sacrament unprepared. Have we received God's judgment? Yes. And were we damned to hell? No. Could we possibly be damned to hell if we keep going on and doing that and not repenting of our sins and thinking that a sinful lifestyle is acceptable before the Lord? But don't let those things make you fearful of coming. It's no different than going to your doctor and getting a medicine, a prescription medicine that benefits you or that's going to heal you or cure you or at least allow you to function or take the pain away, whatever that medicine does. And medicine <coughs> needs to be taken with care, does it not? You need to take it according to the directions that the pharmacist puts on there. And if, you know what happens when we don't take medicine the way it's prescribed? It harms us. But do we let the fear of taking medicine keep, keep us from taking it? Or with fear of what it can do if it's misused? No. We follow the directions. And we follow the directions of our Lord, too, when he tells us to be prepared. To trust in him and his words, know what he's given us, and to know again who we are and what we are. I'm a sinner. I'm in need of forgiveness. That's being prepared. That's remembering. And again, it all focuses on our Lord and what he gives us. He gives us the best thing that we need. And he comes and gives it to us, touches us with it. In the Lord's Supper. 
the blessed gift that is. May we always be thankful and we, may we always run to it, knowing that this is the sweetest meal, the sweetest gift that any one of us can receive from our Lord Jesus. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. I direct your attention to the last page of your bulletin, the back page of it. Um, and we will confess our faith tonight using the words of Luther's explanation to the second article of the Apostles'